Hi, everyone. Welcome back. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, today's topic is atrial fibrillation ablation. I have a separate video about atrial fibrillation in general, but because it is kind of a large topic, I wanted to talk about atrial fibrillation ablation separately. I would recommend that you get a little bit of background on atrial fibrillation from the prior video, but we will uh, give some background for this video as well. Um, we'll talk about what atrial fibrillation is, we'll talk about what ablation is, we'll talk about who's a good candidate for it, and try to answer some of your questions. So to give some more background, atrial fibrillation is an abnormal heart rhythm or arrhythmia. In fact, it is the most common uh, arrhythmia. It's something that originates from the top chamber of the heart, and it can lead to symptoms, it can lead to fast heart rates, and it can uh, lead to uh, clots, which can cause stroke. We'll talk about uh, the, the, the different ways that we can help uh, treat you for it. With regards to the heart, the heart is a muscle. It has uh, its own electrical system, which causes it to contract. So the muscle needs electricity to contract, and the heart has its own automatic uh, electrical system. The way that it works is electricity starts from the, the top part in the sinus node. It spreads through the top, and then it goes down to the bottom. With atrial fibrillation, that nice orderly wave of electricity that courses through the atrium and then goes down to the bottom is replaced with chaotic electrical activity. So instead of a wave of electricity and synchronized contraction of the top chamber, you have chaotic electrical activity occurring in the top chambers of the heart. And that can lead to several consequences. You lose the contraction of the heart so people can get fatigued and tired. You get a fast, irregular heart rate, so people can get palpitations, and you lose the squeezing of the top part of the heart, which can lead to clots, uh, and, and those can lead to uh, stroke. Unfortunately, unfortunately, the pattern of atrial fibrillation is that it is progressive. Initially, people have these episodes of atrial fibrillation, and they go in and out of them. This is what's referred to as paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. Paroxysmal is a word for occasional. People go into it, and they come out of it. Unfortunately, as time goes on, their episodes increase in duration. So they might have episodes that last for 20 minutes and then 40 minutes and then hours, 12, and then sometimes days. And then as time progresses, they also occur get the episodes more frequently as opposed to once a year, they get it once a month and then once a week. And it becomes more and more progressive. Unfortunately, as time goes on, it goes to the point where it's no longer paroxysmal, where it goes into those episodes and it sticks, where you don't come out of it without help. We can shock you out of it using what's called the cardioversion, um, but if you do nothing for atrial fibrillation, it will actually progress to the point where we can't even shock you out of it. And at that point, it becomes labeled permanent atrial fibrillation. The reason for the progressive nature of atrial fibrillation is what's referred to as remodeling. That chaotic electrical storm that occurs with atrial fibrillation leaves scar within the atrium. And that scar actually leaves you more likely to go into it and to have longer episodes. So it becomes a positive feedback loop. You end up having more episodes and it becomes progressive. Because of this, it's important to note that the battle to keep someone in normal rhythm is, a, is an uphill battle. So if there's anything that you can do to help slow down the progression, you ought to do it. So the, the, the big reversible things that we can help are losing weight if, if we're overweight, treating sleep apnea, which is very common, so being tested for sleep apnea and treating it if you have it, avoiding alcohol or caffeine, and those are the things that you can help help uh, pr uh, prevent your progression. We also look at, at the heart valve. Some people have a, a, a leaky or, or, or tight heart valve that can lead to atrial fibrillation, and we treat that if, if, if possible. Also, the biggest driver for atrial fibrillation is atrial fibrillation in and of itself. So if you have atrial fibrillation and you want to be in normal rhythm, it's best to be aggressive early on so that you can prevent the remodeling. If you wait to the, heart, to, to the point that the heart's already remodeled, your chance of success diminishes significantly. So let's go back to uh, atrial fibrillation and, and we'll talk about symptomatology. Some people don't have any symptoms at all. They go into atrial fibrillation and they don't feel it at all. But other people feel it very discreetly on the other end of the spectrum. So the minute they go into it, they feel their atrial fibrillation, they feel their palpitations, they feel tired, and they know immediately when they're in it and out of it. There's also a lot of people that don't feel it discreetly, but feel it as time accumulates. So they might not feel the minute they go into it, but in retrospect, they're like, oh, I'm, I'm kind of wiped out today. And they really feel it when we try to shock them, put them in normal rhythm, and they can compare how they felt 
in normal rhythm, whereas how they may have felt for weeks, if not months prior to that. And, and they're like, oh, I feel so much better. I have more energy. I can breathe. The most common symptom of atrial fibrillation is that of fatigue. People can also get palpitations and shortness of breath and even dizziness. So for people who feel better in normal rhythm, we restore normal rhythm. We take what's called a rhythm control approach. And we'll talk about the different ways that we can do that. Unfortunately, in, in 2020, atrial fibrillation is not a curable disease, but it is highly treatable and we have very effective uh, strategies for it. But we don't have a 100% cure that we can give everyone. The different strategies or the different approaches that we use is to shock the heart, to use antiarrhythmic medication, and or to do an atrial fibrillation ablation. So we'll talk about each of them briefly and we'll talk a little bit more specifically about uh, ablation. With regards to resetting the heart, it's a cardio version. The good news is it's pretty easy. We can put the patches on, give a jolt of electricity, very high likelihood we get you back into normal rhythm. The tough part though is it is a lot easier to get someone into normal rhythm than it is to keep them into normal rhythm. So we can shock the heart, but we haven't altered the reason the person went into fibrillation and oftentimes they will recur at a certain point. This is a non-invasive procedure, however, and it can restore normal rhythm. And for some people, it helps them decide if they would feel better in sinus rhythm. If someone's like, oh, I'm a little bit tired, but I'm not really sure, I'm getting older, we can shock the heart and they can tell, I feel better in normal rhythm than I did yesterday, and that can be very helpful. Unfortunately, uh, it can be difficult to maintain normal rhythm. So for a while, the only approach that we had was antiarrhythmic medications. So there's not a lot of them. They all have potential side effects, and none of them are particularly effective. The best one, our strongest one, our most toxic one, has success rate about 60% at two years. The more innocent ones are clustering around 40 or 50%. This brings up atrial fibrillation ablation. Atrial fibrillation ablation is the most effective treatment for atrial fibrillation. It's a procedure where we enter the, the heart through the groin, through the veins, and we go into it and we actually modify, and we'll talk about how, the trigger for atrial fibrillation. It can eliminate episodes of atrial fibrillation in many people and greatly reduce it in others. Uh, it can often free people from the need for antiarrhythmic medications. It does not, unfortunately, decrease your need for a blood thinner. So this, unfortunately, uh, is not a reason to have it if you want to come off a of blood thinner. That is a separate issue that needs to be treated separately. It has a higher success rate the sooner you do it. So people who are early on in their disease tend to do better. So if you're going to intervene, I suggest that you intervene early to increase your chance for success. So. The basis of atrial fibrillation uh, was discovered, uh, atrial fibrillation ablation was discovered in 1998 in France. Uh, there, they noted that the pulmonary veins, the veins that uh, return blood from the lungs back to the heart on the left side of the heart, are oftentimes the trigger for atrial fibrillation. It's believed that this is 90% of the, the, the trigger. On top of that, this is the most consistent and most stable trigger for atrial fibrillation across populations. So people, particularly those early on in their disease, tend to get elect extra electricity coming from those pulmonary veins, and then it enters the atrium and it overwhelms the uh, atrial's uh, uh, capacity uh, electrically and it puts them into fibrillation. This is a slice of the, the pulmonary vein uh, entering uh, the atrium. And what you can see is that the pink part is, is muscle. And the muscle doesn't just stop where uh, the atrium stop, uh, stops, it continues into the pulmonary veins. You have these what's called myocardial sleeves or little thin muscle filaments that go into the pulmonary veins. They don't have any purpose and they can generate their own electricity. And this is where the atrial fibrillation tends to come from. These are the culprits. So uh, the goal of atrial fibrillation ablation is to isolate these muscle uh, fibers from the heart so that when they give electricity off, it can't enter the atrium and put it into fibrillation. And the way that we do that, as I mentioned, is we go in through the vein, we go uh, up into what's called the IVC or inferior vena cava, and we put catheters into the right atrium, and then we enter the left atrium. And once we have those catheters in, in, in the left atrium, we either burn using radio frequency or freeze using cryoablation to, uh, the, the pulmonary veins so that they can't conduct. So so here is a diagram of the left side of the heart, the left atrium. So you see the four pulmonary veins. We'll zoom in a little bit here. And each vein has the potential and often does have these myocardial sleeves or muscle sleeves uh, that, that uh, are, don't serve any purpose. And they can give electricity. They just generate their own electricity. And it can occur very quickly. And 
it can bombard the left atrium and it actually can put it into fibrillation. So the whole purpose of atrial fibrillation ablation is to enter the left side of the heart and to burn if you use radiofrequency or freeze if you use cryoablation around the, uh, the pulmonary veins so that the next time that these guys try to fire, it encounters a scar. And once electricity hits a scar, it can't conduct to the rest of the atrium and then it can't go into fibrillation. And so before ablation, it, there's nothing, uh, uh, nothing holding back these pulmonary veins from putting the heart into to fibrillation. But after ablation, you have the scar to hopefully prevent you from going to fibrillation. Uh, as I mentioned, atrial fibrillation is a procedure we do through the veins. It's not open surgery. We go in through the vein. Um, you, uh, you have to be anesthetized. So you have to go under general anesthesia. Usually takes about two to four hours or so. Um, most of us keep patients uh, in the hospital overnight for, for recovery and for, for monitoring. Um, I like to get a CT scan to make sure uh, there are no surprises, make sure that your anatomy is the normal anatomy. Um, and, and really, that's about it. But uh, the vast, vast majority of people go home the next day. You can drive sometime uh, within a week or so, um, but no heavy lifting for about 10 days. As I mentioned, atrial fibrillation is uh, the most successful uh, strategy uh, for, 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 um, for, uh, uh, for treating atrial fibrillation. It's considerably more successful than medication. Um, uh, they tend to cluster around 80% success rate, whereas uh, medications tend to cluster between 50 and 60%. Um, that's across populations. People tend to do even better if they intervene early. So if someone's early on in their disease, if they're paroxysmal or, or occasional with their atrial fibrillation, they tend to have uh, higher success rates. So for that reason, I highly recommend that if you are going to intervene, that you intervene early. Try to, uh, keep, uh, try to uh, have the best possible chance of success. Any uh, procedure in the heart is, is not without risk. Those risks are small and they're known. So we have strategies to monitor for them, and heaven forbid if they, were, were, uh, if they do occur, uh, to treat them. As far as who's a good candidate for uh, atrial fibrillation ablation, certainly people early on in their disease tend to do better. Uh, it's better to intervene early. Uh, uh, um, you have to be able to be healthy enough to go under general anesthesia. So if your overall uh, health is, is too frail to go under general anesthesia, it's probably not a good idea. If you're uh, healthier, generally, the better that you do. Atrial fibrillation uh, ablation tends to help people with symptoms the most. Uh, for the most part, it's something that we do to help control symptoms. However, recent data has fairly consistently shown that people who are younger and those with heart failure actually have a survival benefit, meaning that they live longer with atrial fibrillation ablation. This is uh, new data from a couple of years ago called the, the Cabana trial or the Castle HF trial. So if you're young uh, or if you have heart failure, even if you don't have symptoms, you should consider atrial fibrillation ablation. Um, and the nice thing is it can free you from uh, antiarrhythmic medications. As I mentioned before, uh, it does not prevent you from uh, needing to be on a blood thinner if you meet indications for blood thinner. So that's not a valid indication for, for, for ablation. Um, early intervention is key. Um, so you can live in atrial fibrillation. It's not a, a fatal life, uh, a fatal uh, uh, arrhythmia. But you might not have to. So if you feel better in normal rhythm, you should pursue that, and you should pursue it early on. Drugs can offer some control, but as mentioned, atrial fibrillation has a significantly better uh, efficacy at treating atrial fibrillation. Um, keep in mind the natural history of atrial fibrillation. This is something where, where uh, the writing's on the wall. If, if you are starting to progress with your fibrillation, this is not going to go away. So. I hope this helps. Um, I, I know uh, it's a lot of information, and that's why we uh, uh, split it in two different videos. The other thing that I want to tell you, though, is that it is something that you need to individualize. So only you and your doctor can discuss what's best for your atrial fibrillation. Each patient, each situation is, is different. Uh, um, so play an active part in that. Talk to your doctor. And if there's anything that I can help with, please let me know. Thanks so much for tuning in, and we will see you next time.